Tune in to Alternate Ending now. Welcome back to Alternate Ending. I'm correspondent Brennan Klein here with my former Attack of the Queer Wolf podcast co-host, and more importantly, the co-screenwriter of upcoming Freaky. Well, I guess it's out by the time you're watching this. It's, <laughs> um, let me check my notes. Michael Kennedy, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank Hi, you so Brennan. much for joining us. Hi, how's it going? Thanks for having me. It's going, you know. I do know. Good? <laughs> yeah. Question mark? I will say specifically movie-wise, it's going very well. Good. That's good to hear. Well, yeah. you know, let's get into it. So basically, okay. um, you know, all of the obviously extremely negative and harrowing aspects of the pandemic aside, which is, you know, hard to put aside, but let's try right. for one second. You know, Freaky was basically going to be like, you know, obviously a strong part, but like a part of the kind of tapestry of Hollywood movies in the fall. But now it is the movie of the back half of 2020. How does it that really feel? Is. I mean, it's, it's crazy, you know, like it's, 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 it feels good, you know, cause I feel like it's, it's getting a lot of attention right now. Cause we're not really competing with anything else. Um, and people are really responding to it. The studio did like a 200 screenings this past week for free to people to get like a word of mouth screen. And like the buzz from that has been really positive. But the, and the thing that I'm taking away from most of those, cause I, I didn't know this going into it, but we literally get everything sent to us like every day, like any review that gets written, we get a copy of it and stuff. So like I get to see everything firsthand. Wow. And the common theme I'm seeing is that people feel so happy for an hour and 40 minutes. Um, so, nor you know, I would love to have this movie had come out in quote unquote normal times. Cause I think it would have been a big hit honestly, um, with the way the buzz is going and the critical reaction. But then again, would the buzz and the critical reaction be the same if people weren't in such dire situation and needed an outlet for it? Um, well, here's so, the thing. I, knowing you and Chris, yes, the critical <laughs> appreciation would have been probably the same, but the, the kind of, the way it's kind of existing in the market is so unique. No other movies had this kind of situation before. Yeah, and I, you know, I think, um, you know, people talk about how Tenant was supposed to be like kind of the re-kickoff of the box office and not a knock against that movie or anything. I just don't think it's the right movie for what's going on right now. People don't want to go see a two and a half hour, like kind of, I don't want to say dour, but people want to laugh right now if they can get a laugh in, you know, or a, a jolt um, followed by a nervous laugh, you know? So it is really unique. I feel like, you know, Chris and I have talked about it in the studio has said it like I literally right before this interview I got like the final studio um, marketing and target outreach type email that they've been sending once a week to kind of give let us know like what kind of awareness is going on out there with audiences and stuff and like they really land on that a lot like how this is such a unique situation that no other movie has ever had um, but my favorite thing is, is it's, it's, it's a big conversation station right now people are oh. talking about it, you know and it, it's it's extra special because this is your you know screenwriting feature film debut yeah it's nuts and all other movies were like let's step aside for michael <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's crazy it's really crazy um i know that we like had like they had discussed like pushing it to next year mm -hmm. um but I think everyone ultimately landed on like people need this type of movie right now, um, no matter where they see it. Um, so I'm really happy about that. You know, it's bittersweet because, you know, you read article, like I read an article yesterday, like this one review was talking about how much fun the movie was. And they're like, it's a shame it's not opening when people can go to the theater safely or feel safe going to the theater. Cause this would have been a massive hit. And like selfishly, I'm like, Oh, that, that would have been like really good for my bank account, but <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, I, I'm just really, really, I mean, I couldn't ask for a better first release, right? Like first movie, you get to work with Landon, to work with Blumhouse and then write a movie that people seem to be enjoying. I mean, shit, everything else is icing. Yeah, exactly. That, And you are right that, you know, this is the kind of thing that, 
people need right now, especially because you know we're 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 gearing up for a for a bit of a fall. It seems like. Yeah, I think we're gearing up for another another lockdown. Honestly. <sighs> yes, we are. Yeah. Um, but like you know, it's it's so nice that you know just the timeline of this movie worked out well enough that it's like this is something that can you know buoy fans, you know, through. Whatever. We don't have to talk about this. Um, <laughs> but okay, so um basically obviously, you know, you and I met and bonded over kind of like the queer horror realm, that whole space. And especially slashers for you and I. Oh yeah. Yeah. We we speak slashers more than we speak English. Yes. Actually actually absolutely one hundred percent. But um specifically, you know your goal here of like putting an openly queer character into a slasher movie like this. Um, what was kind of your, did you set an intention for how you wanted to, you know, kind of write that character or how you wanted it or them to, you know, kind of behave in this movie or what, what did you want people to get out of it? And how did you go about trying to accomplish that? Um, I know for me personally, and I think Chris feels a lot the same way a lot is from the moment this movie was conceived, Joshua was distinctly made to be this out, proud, brazen, you know, no fucks given, we'll say what he's thinking type character. We wanted to show, I know for me personally, it was a do over. Joshua, I literally put myself into Joshua, but in the sense that this is the character, this is the person I wish I was when I was 17 or had the ability to be when I was 17. I was a closeted, quiet kid um, trying to just survive. And, and that's okay, you know, but Joshua was a chance for me to kind of relive my high school days in a way that is refreshing in fucking just confident and at times ruthless you know he allows himself to be flawed and chris and i both from day one were like this is who joshua is um we kind of talked about how joshua is the type of character that he's one step ahead of everybody else because he's already out of bliss field in his mind like as soon as he graduates dude is gone um because he knows he's destined for bigger and greater beautiful things um so like my intention with that is twofold i want people who aren't queer to know that people like joshua exist um but also take away from that like oh my god look at how thriving this person is maybe i need to be nicer to the shy quiet gay kid in the corner um but I also wrote it, we wrote it for ourselves, our 16 year old selves who were shy and quiet and scared. And I get emotional talking about it because I, we didn't get those characters as kids. Um, we had to, I, which was beautiful, but we got to identify through the Sydneys and the Lorries and those type of characters. But to be able to create a character that a 16 year old kid in Nebraska who's scared of everything can watch this movie and feel seen and excited and confident and safe. And if one kid feels that way, that's the best thing that'll happen to me from this movie. Um, so I get emotional talking about it because it's so I don't know. It's it's such an honor to be able to introduce this character. Um, and Chris just directed the hell out of the movie. So like Joshua is like, he steals the movie. <laughs> yeah. And okay. So obviously, you know, you, you don't want to, you know, seem like you're bragging or overhype yourself. But yeah, no, this is an, you know, a capital I important character to exist. It is. That's not something so. you can say, but I can say it about you. Okay, good. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> And like what you were saying, you know, um, it was nice they got to um, relate to Sidney Prescott or Laurie Strode or that kind of thing. And but that literally is you are, you know, if you are a cis gay man um, or cis gay boy at the time, you're you're translating your body into another sex, into another gender. 
And that kind of thing is obviously something that you're playing with in the movie. Right. Um, wh- were, was there a certain way you wanted to approach the body swap that was from a more like queer gender oriented aspect or was it like full broad comedy you were going for? Um, I think, you know, we, it was kind of a bit of both, you know, we did not like the beauty of a character like Joshua, for instance, is that we got to do all those things I just talked about, but we weren't preachy about it. And it wasn't like, Hey, look at this character. It was just like, this character gets to live and breathe and their actions and what they say speak for themselves. Right. We kind of did the body swap that way. We knew immediately in this day and age that it was, um, you know, we wanted to speak about it as gender identity, but also just identity as a whole. And I think the beauty of it is that Chris, really early when we discussed it, and when we were writing it, and most importantly when he was directing it, that he wanted to play all those big moments straight. Um, Like there's a really tender scene between Millie and her crush, but Millie's in Vince's body. And like, it's, we wrote it seriously. Chris directed it as a serious moment. So it comes across that way. You know what I mean? Like it it lands with the audience. Um, So I think like the biggest thing, it it was intentional, but we didn't want to like, we didn't want to be like, this is our plan. It was more more like, let's treat this like the serious and beautiful thing it is. Like this is actually happening. What is this person going to do with it? Exactly. Um, and I think that speaks louder than going into a movie and saying, this is what this stands for. And if you don't like it, fuck you. You know what I mean? Like, mm. <laughs> I think it speaks more. And Vince's performance is so endearing. Um, and that was the beauty of working with an actor like him. You know, we may have like differences of opinion about stuff, but like he loved the story and he loved the character. And he loved what we were saying with the character underneath everything. And so he brought that to his performance as Millie. But we also did things like, if you watch the movie, the butcher, no matter whose body he's in, is always referred to as he. And Millie, no matter whose body she's in, is always referred to as she. And for Chris and I, those little touches were like super important to have because you don't notice them, but if you notice them, it's like, I don't want to say educational, but it's just like, again, this is just what it is. It's like modeling behavior. Yes, exactly. And it like, that was a thing we have Celeste O'Connor and Misha Oshirovich who play Nyla and Josh. They're both non-binary actors. Oh, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. So like going into the movie, it was so great for both of those actors to read those characters and they both just managed to say something at one point, like, oh, I love that we like always refer to Millie as she. And like, it wasn't more than a statement than that, but it was just like, that was such a great decision. You know, um, we even wrote in the script, like they're still the same person. They're, they're like brains, their, their brains are still there. Like, you know what I mean? Like we even wrote in the mm-hmm. script, like Millie's still Millie. She's just in someone else's body. You know what I mean? Like, um, so I think I answered your question. You did answer my question. <laughs> um, well, and I guess it's time for me to present another one. Um, so, I mean, obviously you're adding a, a queer element to the slasher film that's not really present a lot in the history of slashers. Yeah. And again, as, as two people who are very into slasher movies and kind of understand the formula and kind of the way that things go, was there any other element that you kind of wanted to kind of explode and kind of change to your own purposes as you're writing Freaky? Um, I mean, like personally for me, I really wanted to explore grief. You know, like the movie, I can't remember if I told you that or not, but the movie came about because of the death of my dad, you know, and I was exploring my own grief. And um, weirdly enough, through a body switching slasher, I was able to explore that through the character of Millie. And it's really was a cathartic journey for me to write, but it's also cathartic to watch her kind of navigate the same world. But at the same time, like the true nature of this film is about self discovery and identity. You know, the body swap and the slasher element are almost like secondary. Um, but of course I'm going to write it in a slasher world. Cause I don't know anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it's where you live. <laughs> yes. Oh, well on, on that end, um, 
when you were writing Freaky, were you still, you know, consuming slashers at the degree that you normally do? Or were you kind of abstaining, like, you know, trying to like... pause on everything related to the movie. Like, Chris and I both didn't watch any body swap films. Like, I didn't want, personally, I didn't want to be influenced by anything. I knew a lot of the movie's lores. Like, I've seen Freaky Friday. I've seen The Hot Chick. I've seen a lot of the things and knew... The biggest concern for me was, like, how do we do the swap? Like, what's the rules? But I didn't want to watch anything else because I was afraid we'd, like, accidentally crib something. And then I didn't watch a lot of slashers, but there's two movies that I did watch kind of a lot Okay. during it. But I watched them a lot all the time anyway, and it was Jennifer's Body and Scream. That uh, tracks. <laughs> Yeah, and I watched Jennifer's body to kind of like, in a lot of ways, Jennifer is going through a body swap herself, you know? Oh, for sure. You know, and then Sydney, we just, I, for me personally, I just wanted to really, like I watched Scream in such a different way while doing the movie. Like I really, really, really paid attention to every specific detail of Sydney and her arc and stuff. Um, you know, and just, yeah, those were like my two biggest influences, but you're right. I did kind of tend to stay away from anything in the realm because I just didn't want to be influenced by anything. I, we knew what we wanted and we didn't want to like, for me, I didn't want to accidentally rip anything off, <laughs> you know? Um, but we also wanted to like, just come from a place of like, oh, hey, this is our story. How do we tell it? Oh, absolutely. And okay. So we've talked about the actual like, story elements and you know all those beautiful things like theme and character but what i'm curious about is how do you approach writing a murder like where do you start with that um for me it's just like what's the scariest way to to do this um it's cathartic as fuck i'll tell you that like there were many times um i actually just wrote another slasher movie that is going to shoot next year. And I wrote it during lockdown. Um, so it was cathartic as fuck to like kill somebody on paper. <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> like, to get a lot of my anxiety and stress and anger out. Um, but I, there's two ways I do it. I kind of like, there's probably more than two ways, but there's way, sometimes it's like just a matter of going, okay, what has been done before and how can I do it differently? What has been done before and how can I change the same thing? And then I know on this movie for Chris, it was like, I did Happy Death Day. How do I do something similar, but just go hardcore? So all the inventive kills in the movie were essentially Chris's idea. Um, I knew going in that we were going to do an R-rated film that was going to be bloody and gory. and There was going to be bad language and stuff, but Chris really was the one that was like, let's go fucking nuts, <laughs> you know? Um, so like approaching a murder in this film, it's so over the top. It felt like writing like jokes in a way. You know what I mean? Like we were setting- hey, Sprinkling gags. Yeah, we were setting up the joke and then the kill was the punchline. Um, but because of Chris, he manages to make some of the kills like pretty squeamish and also like kind of scary. And like, there's some nifty jump scares to it, which I know a lot of people get really turned off by jump scares. I don't know why. Um, but he had really fun, a really fun time shooting the movie that way. You know, mm -hmm. the characters, like the actors did too. Like anytime they had to bump into each other and stuff. And it was always really funny because they were bumping into Millie or like bumping into, I'm sorry, they were bumping into Catherine. Oh, like, like the Blissfield Butcher in Catherine's yeah. body, yeah. Yeah, and being like, oh, I'm safe, you know? And it's like, no, you're not. Like, <laughs> yeah. So that was fun because it was so different. You know what I mean? Like we yeah. got to do like the first act of the film, we got to write these really fun, hopefully scary set pieces that kind of live in stuff you've seen before. But then we got to turn it on our own heads 30 pages in and like, create these really unique kills while also the character having no fucking clue that they're really up against a serial killer. Mm -hmm. um, and that was hard too, because we did that like one, two, three, four, like four or five different times. And so you have to find different ways to not repeat this, the unknowing character's reaction to it. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. So that was like difficult at times. 
to it was also really fun because it became really inventive. Um, it was just a lot of fun. A lot of fun. It sounds like a lot of fun, and I can't wait for yeah. everybody to see it. You too. Um, it, I mean, at the again, at the point of this recording, like we're so close. It's on the horizon. We can taste well, it's the like. Well, going to be on VOD December fourth. I'm sorry. It's going to be on VOD December fourth, so people will be able to see it like right away if they don't go to the theater. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, if if you can go safely, go to a drive-in, do whatever you need to do, see this movie. But you yeah. can also wait till December fourth. Yep. That's not a scoop, but I'm going to pretend it is. <laughs> um, but yes, okay. So what else do I have here in my bag of tricks? Um, well, okay. Here's the fun one that I wrote. I like to. I try to write a fun one, and it's going to be one that you've been asked a million times. But if okay. you could swap bodies with any fictional character, who would it be? Oh, I actually haven't been asked this yet. Cha ching. Um, Go me. Fictional character, Gail Weathers. <laughs> Duh. It would be fun to, you know, live in that confidence for even exactly. an hour. Exactly. I literally did an interview this morning where it was like, who, who are like people real or fictional that like you look up to. And I was telling the person Gail Weathers and they were kind of like, Wait, why? And I was like, <laughs> that confidence is fucking effervescent. Like it's so captivating and addicting. And like, Sure, it's Gail's like worst trait, but it's also her best asset. You know what I mean? And it's mm. like, and like, just look at her arc over what will soon to be five movies. It's just imagine being that confident all the time and like not giving any fucks. I wish I could. I don't. Right? I don't think I even have the capacity to envision it. I don't either. You know, and I would even let myself have red red streaks like that to, to live a day in her body. <laughs> <laughs> what about the bangs? Fine. Give them to me. <laughs> you know, they do make a statement. You do have to have confidence to live to live under those. Oh, yeah. To have under, those under things, that regime. Things on your forehead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and one more question. Okay. And I can I can cut this if it's too if it's too cutting. Okay. Um, but um, you know, the, the, the lore of Freaky goes that, you know, it, it started off as like a, a practice pitch where you're at lunch with Chris and just, you know, going over the script. Be honest, Michael, were you secretly hoping Chris would want to direct this movie and fall in love with it? Fucking course. <laughs> <laughs> like, I told him that, like, I, I've told him that, that there was, like, when I was talking to him at lunch, at lunch, I had no intention. I was just telling okay. him at, at lunch. But when he said he'd meet with me to go over it, there was a little tiny part of me that was like, what if he likes this? And then I was, there was a little, then there was a bigger part of me that was like, I hope he wants to do this. But I also was very sure to tell myself, don't get your hopes up. Mm -hmm. What he's doing now is already so helpful. You know what I mean? Just like, like, what a good guy. Who does that? Like, oh, I'll help you get it ready. You know what I mean? One of the busiest people I know. Um, but yeah, he, 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 we laughed on set one day because I told him, I was like, I was trying to personally hope you were going to do it. And then he, he goes, you little, he goes, you little sneak. <laughs> and he goes, well, you know what? He goes, when I was reading it, he was like, I was like, I hope this bitch knows I'm going to be doing this. <laughs> like... <laughs> So, so it was like a perfect work well together. Yeah. You know, we work really well together and he supervised me writing my newest script. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah. So we work together again and I have a feeling we'll work more in the future. Hopefully we'll get to do a sequel and stuff. So, um, but yeah, I, oh yeah. It's that 100%. I was like, oh, please do this. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that that was the one I was like, mm, let's be careful on that one. Um, well, okay. So, without saying literally anything, but do you have an idea for a freaky, freaky sequel? Like, are you ready? Okay, yep. Yep. that's good. That's good to yep. know. It's not fully fleshed out, but we have, I will say we have more than one idea. Ooh, 18 um, ideas. Many ways it could go. And Chris has mentioned this many times. So, and Jason Blum has too. So I will tell you this too. I really okay. wanted to, my, me, I really, 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 really want to get Tree and Millie together. 
Oh, yeah. And yeah, for those not in the know, Tree is the, the final girl from Heavy Death Day. Yeah. I mean, Chris has said online that they're definitely in the same world. Um, so um, I want that to happen more than anything in the world. <laughs> okay. Oh, and with that, okay, I have one question. You know, in, in, in Freaky 5 or whatever, you know, w- w- when we get there, um, what is the, like, wildest dream casting, like, for a killer that you would want of, like, any gender, like, any age? Like, who would you want to play the killer in this movie? Yeah, I have so many. Charlize Theron. Ooh, uh-huh. Amazing. Um, Jennifer Lopez would be amazing. Um, I think those two would be at the top of my list. I really, I will say this. I, if we do get to do another one, I, there's a part of me that really wants to introduce like a female butcher. Oh um, yeah. And how she's connected to the butcher, I'm not gonna say, cause I already have ideas. Um, but I would love, like imagine Charlie Theron first as a killer and then playing like a teenage boy. I can't imagine that. It's and just like, so right, good. it just writes itself. Um, I also really wanted, really have thought about Cameron Diaz. Ooh. So I think that is super interesting because she reminds me a lot of like Vince in the sense that they did comedy for such a long time then kind of pivoted. Mm. Um, but then I was just reading like she retired like six years ago. Um, really? So part of me is like, hmm, how do we get, how do we rope her into doing it? But then again, let's, you know, Chris is superstitious. So he's like, I don't even want to talk about sequels until the movie comes out. Oh, where I'm like, course. okay, well, this is what we would do in two. This is what we do in three. This is what we do in Freaky Death Day. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, yeah, no, you know, every, everyone has their own approach, and that's fair, and that's yeah. why I didn't talk to Chris about this. <laughs> um, but, yes. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. And look, I, I, I do hope that everyone sees it in whatever way they are able to and feel safest doing exactly. and just have a good time. Yep. Like that's the that's the goal of this. Movie. Like, go have fun. Mm-hmm. Go have fun. Get lost. Lost in a world, I should say. Don't get lost, but <laughs> <laughs> on the way to the drive-in. <laughs> yeah. And I do post. I've been posting like the on Twitter. I've been posting the Los Angeles drive-in times for people mm-hmm. <laughs> because I know some people just won't go to a theater, and I totally respect that. Um, there's part of me that wonders if I should even go to a theater, but. You know, the good thing is, is I did do research on theaters right now, and there, there's literally been zero cases traced back to a movie theater, um, which is super comforting. Um, but I, I saw it at the drive-in the first time, and it was so fun. It's a perfect drive-in movie. Yeah, it, it, it seems like the right fit, too. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you know, seeing Tenet at a drive-in, that's not, that's not, the, that's not the vibe. <laughs> seeing Tenet during a pandemic is, like, not. What yeah, I, also... <laughs> I mean, I can't speak to the state of everyone's mental health, but I couldn't sit down for two and a half hours to watch a movie in this pandemic. Not to knock the movie. I'm sure it's wonderful. But right now, no thank you. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'll wait. (laughs) Uh, I mean, I was going to anyway. Could you imagine seeing Tenet in theaters? That's for straight people. (laughs) Um, That's actually, that's what I told... um, the the folks at alternate ending where obviously um tim who's the lead reviewer was going to be doing the review of tenet and i was like that's fine i'm not gonna i'm not gonna fight this <laughs> you have fun yeah <laughs> it's really funny. um thank you anyway um yeah so we're running up on our time but okay. you mentioned your twitter do you want to tell people where they can find you out there on the internet and follow yeah, those uh, show times Twitter is at Michael Ken Ken, and then my Instagram is at Michael T J Kennedy. All right, lots of freaky content. Like and subscribe. Click on yeah. all sorts of links and whatnot. See you um, here, here, here yeah. everywhere. <laughs> um, and yeah, check out Freaky. Um, this is not the last you'll be hearing from Michael. Um, and I'm really excited for everyone to see your movie. Thanks, buddy. It's so great to talk to you. I miss you. Likewise, I miss you too. Yeah. But you know, we're we can connect. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh goodbye everybody. Thanks so much Bye. for listening. Thank you, Brennan. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>